This is Twit. Let's head for the skies and take a look at our atmosphere. So if we go ahead and start the uh, short shots, here we go. Well, this is a normal day out there, whereas we go higher in altitude, uh, the temperature goes down. For every 300 feet, we lose one degree. For uh, every mile, we lose 20 degrees Fahrenheit. As we go higher, we uh, have uh, less moisture in the atmosphere. Every 1,000 feet up, we lose a half a gram of uh, uh, moisture and pressure decreases with height logarithmically. Uh, for every uh, uh, 10 mil, make that 10 meters of altitude, we lose one millibar. And for every kilometer of altitude, we lose 100 millibars. And that's on a normal day. But you know, every so often in May, for sure June, and absolutely always in July, our atmosphere, the weather layer, does something a little bit different. What occurs is a high pressure system will override a big area of the United States and will become stationary. And these stationary high pressure systems will begin to drop called subsidence. And when they meet the cold air down at the surface, they get compressed. And when you compress air, what happens? The temperature goes up. Well, when the temperature goes up in a stratified air mass, you'll find that it many times will become so refractive that it'll do things to VHF radio waves that you wouldn't believe. And as you'll see here tonight, to optical waves that you won't believe either. Well, same thing occurs when we have a warm air mass overriding ambient cold air. Many times there'll be a refractive index great enough to cause VHF and UHF signals, FM, sideband, CW, to travel literally hundreds of extra miles. So communications could take place from New England down to the Florida Keys, Texas uh, all the way down to Yucatan, uh, California all the way to Hawaii, Chicago is here in Texas. I mean, when we get weather systems like this during the summer months, interesting things happen. Automatic position reporting system. Uh, if you go on to an APRS site called mountainlake.k12.mn.us, you'll actually see where APRS packets go a lot further than just one or two little eye gates. So we watch our APRS unit and we see all sorts of things. Well, we might see a balloon as we did a few years ago, uh, just drifting around at 74,000 feet. But you know, you don't need altitude to take advantage of tropospheric ducting. What we need is that high pressure, stable air system. And here are two high pressure, very stable people. That's Don Arnold, W6GPS on the right. And Leo with Kenwood out in the Los Angeles area. And they were instrumental this past weekend of really getting our APRS units humming, uh, the Kenwood D-72s, for a large public service event we were doing out there. The Coast Guard many times will report it's picking up long-range echo returns from vessel far out at sea, well beyond VHF. This is our big Coast Guard monitoring station here at Point Furman. And on their radars, they're getting images out uh, well beyond what would normally be line of sight. Generally, radio waves are uh, going four-thirds over the horizon with a little bit of bending. But microwaves many times will even go further as seen on this 9 gigahertz marine radar system, uh, causing the radio waves to go a lot further. And here's another look at uh, radar aboard small boats getting a real boost thanks to that high pressure system overhead. Mariners have a different version of APRS. It's called AIS, Automatic Identification System. And they too are getting signature hits of vessels hundreds of miles away when they're on their local radio bands on VHF Marine Band. So all sorts of things happen when we have high pressure systems and we have stratification. And you can see that next time you're out on the highway, look ahead. Well, is that water in the road? Well, let's take a little closer look. Oh, no, that's a reflection of the truck well ahead. 
And that reflection is really a refraction of the optical waves above, refracting off of the superheated air off the pavement and bending that signal back to us. So you can actually see the effects of tropospheric ducting. Off Southern California, we have an island 26 miles across the sea called Catalina. And there's a little notch on Catalina that looks normal. Two hours later, that same notch with the seagull looks abnormal. Two hours after that, the notch begins to become a bridge. We're watching this. Two hours later, that notch now becomes a well-defined ridge and a great tunnel. This is the same view. And now you begin to see that superheated air just capping the smog layer down below off the cool water. And as we look again, wow, what a sight to see. It is a phenomena that uh, occurs many times over cool ocean waters when we have a high pressure system settling in. And now look at this. It's masking a lot of the island. You can't even see it due to the refraction of the light waves coming in from above. And most amazing, this is a shot in a lifetime, in the background off to the starboard of the big tanker's bow is a refractive reflection of that tanker actually seen off the warm air inversion layer. So this summer, we encourage all of you to get on your VHF and UHF radios, even microwaves, and take advantage of tropospheric ducting, usually occurring in the presence of a high-pressure system overhead, and many times the trigger for a strong, week-long tropospheric duct are two or more hurricanes to the south moving north. We can take a look at computer renditions at dxinfocenter.com and be sure and spell center, C-E-N-T-R-E.com. The red area and the buff area back to the red area to Southern California extends all the way to Hawaii, where with a handheld, you can many times work some of the stations in the Mauna Loa area. That volcano, by the way, really... Uh, uh, giving off uh, a quite uh, spectacular show right now. And if we look at water vapor, we'll see that it's undisturbed from the Southland all the way to Hawaii. Well, for those of you on the East Coast and those in the Midwest, the same thing occurs. And that is the sinking hot air will develop a tropospheric duct. And you might be able to pick up the VHF weather station two states away on 162 megahertz. So I encourage all of you during times of high pressure systems, and this is the late Paul Lieb, KH6HME, that pioneered many of the tropospheric records from Hawaii to California. And um, the um, uh, Hawaii end is Fred and his team of experts that beam a signal back to us over 2,500 miles away. So weather conditions look good for this summer for hot weather, for a long tropospheric ducting season. Here is a record breaker from Hawaii all the way down to Baja, California, setting new records. And who knows, maybe you'll set a record or two. But remember, the tropospheric duct only lasts in the presence of still calm air. And you see that dark area with the letter U? That means it's unsettled. And when we have unsettled air, say goodbye to the tropospheric duct. But the tropospheric duct will appear big time throughout all of the United States and here in Southern California, generally on July 1st. That's when we'll see the most activity. So take advantage of tropospheric ducting. When it's real hot and it's sticky outside and you see that band of brown air, it's going to do something interesting to your radio waves. Here we see radio waves in layers, but they're actually not radio waves, but light waves. And look what happens when we bring this up and we get to this area here. Do you see it immediately turn green? And if we go above that area, it's out of the duct. So here is a tropospheric duct, and you can see that it'll actually bend a light wave all the way back. This is the layering of the atmosphere that creates all of the excitement for ham radio operators being able on the two meter and 440 band to work repeaters hundreds 
hundreds, maybe four and 500 miles away with just 25 watts of power and a single vertical antenna. So have fun with tropospheric ducting. Bob has uh, been doing this for years and years, and we've got pictures of him on his big tower. And Bob, uh, how about telling us what your best uh, DX range was for days on end during high pressure times when tropospheric ducting is at its best? Bob? That all happened in 1962 from Marissa, Illinois, 50 miles southeast of St. Louis. And... Um, uh, several times I worked each one of the coasts, and I I thought that was amazing. Oh, uh, thinking, wow. uh, th got to think about uh, the gear that we had in those days. We had to build it. Uh, I built my two meter converter, had it on a fifty one J four, fifty one J three Collins receiver, but uh, you know it, it was tough. Uh, it's a lot easier today because the gear's all there, but. It still is remarkable what you can do, and guys need to really go after it. I mean, it's it's to me, Gordo, and I think you'll agree, it's uh, it's really real time radio because you you really have to work to get just one little blip of a contact, right? Oh boy, you're absolutely right, Bob. And at the Dayton Hamvention next weekend, we're going to be promoing a uh, tropo duct along with live demonstrations, uh, maybe even some uh, fluid management with uh, right. light waves. And, of course, we'll have all of the sounds of long-haul tropoducting on 2 and 432, Bob.